Welcome back to the program. It is a uh, good morning, Kenya, wherever you are. And uh, it is now time for that particular discussion where we talk about matters of uh, community policing and uh, what is your role in terms of ensuring that this country is secure uh, pre and uh, post election that uh, we'll be having in August. And uh, in studio with me is Dr. Francis Sang. Is a member of uh, the committee on uh, citizen, uh, the committee on citizen participation in security, and uh, we'll be talking about especially matters as uh, small farms and that have been a problem in this country, especially in some of uh, uh, the arid and uh, semi-arid areas. Dr. Sang, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Happy to have you this morning to talk about this very interesting topic. By the way, if you ask me, small farms. Thank you very much for welcoming me. Yes. yes. We want to talk about small farms exactly. Which class, do you have classification of uh, the farms? Yes, we, we, we have a um, the classification of small arms. Mm -hmm. When we, we talk about uh, small arms, we are talking about farms which are concealable, portable, you can easily be able to carry them, and can be operated by one or two people. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about small arms, are those arms which you can be easily be able to dismantle, and then reassemble them, you can conceal them. And, carry. and these are the worst arms which uh, are more dangerous even than the other arms, which, the big arms which they normally call uh, tankers, uh, the warships. Those are the big guns, which is not actually a threat to this country. And that's why uh, at the international level, in 19, uh, 2001, mm -hmm. they came up with a treaty which brought together all member states uh, of the United Nations to sign a United Nations Program of Action, a treaty, in which they, can, they could now be able to implement the issues of small arms mm -hmm. in their respective countries. And I'll be talking about the treaty later. But then, when you talk about the small arms that yes. we are referring to, uh, what are the guidelines that underpin its usage? So that Emias Martin, um, also entitled to having them, uh, and, and if I, I am to have access to them, what are the requirements, the basic requirements? You see, every, every citizen in every, every country has, um, has the liberty to apply uh, to possess a, a firearm for his own security purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite a number of those who actually apply uh, actually given the firearms by the government. But there are certain processes in which one would be able to undergo uh, before a firearm is issued. Mm -hmm. Because you'll agree with me that if everybody is actually given the firearms, they might likely to misuse it. Mm -hmm. So there are actually the security team, like in, in Kenya we have what we call Central Firearm um, Bureau, mm -hmm. which has got a board which vets those who wants to have a, a firearm. And it starts off uh, from the ground level all along to that particular board, which is function and see they will be able to scrutinize you, vet you, what are your temperaments when you uh, possess a gun, because some of other people can be able to misuse. And uh, wherever you are actually provoked within a very short time, then you can misuse that time. Mm -hmm. So it's, there, there are many, many other issues which should be looked into before one is actually issued with a firearm. And so the question will be, because the question of uh, small farms is one that has uh, been so, um, you know, uh, what you can call widespread in this country. And, and you talk of uh, having uh, what you call the central... Um, Farms Bureau. Farms Bureau. Yes. If that's the case, then how do we end up having illegal farms in this country, um, or these farms in the hands of uh, some of these bandits that we see, uh, because that's a problem? When you have a bureau that regulates its usage, how so, do they get access yeah, to yeah. it? They are, they are good citizens, so have actually, they have farms which is actually licensed and they are uh, renewed annually. And uh, the government has got uh, the database for those who, have actually, who are actually having those firearms. But on the other side, there are illegal firearms, which the government has not been able to account even for it. And these are the firearms which has really been causing a lot of havoc in this country. And I'll just give an example of the northern part of, uh, of Kenya. Mm -hmm. They are quite, uh, the statistic which was actually taken some times back by 
Security Information Research Center mm -hmm. indicated that there were over 500,000 illicit firearms circulating in the northern part of Kenya. Where are these firearms coming from? We all know very well that uh, we, these firearms come uh, from uh, the neighboring country. Kenya has actually been a peaceful country, but we have been having a stable uh, and stable neighbors, and wherever there have actually been uh, conflicts, firearms have always been proliferating into our country. And, and, and that has actually been the problem. So, so, so you find that uh, uh, these firearms find their way into the country. You, you, you find that the, uh, the pastoralist community, because of the insecurity, which is well pronounced in those areas, they will always be able to find for illicit firearms so that they can be able to go and attack their neighbors and, and, and steal their stock. And you very well know that uh, it is not a matter of cut rustling alone. There have actually been uh, uh, cases where people have actually been killed as a result of that kind of cut rustling. If those communities uh, feel like we are insecure, we, we are not getting a lot of um, uh, support from the government in terms of securing us, and uh, one of these findings is they said, listen, we want to apply for farms from uh, small farms, as it were, uh, from the uh, registration bureau. Yeah. Will you issue them with those particular... You, you know, the, the government has actually gone as far as even giving them amnesty to surrender their farms. But, but you know, they have not actually... Some of them have not been very responsive. But because they feel insecure, if they surrender them and, and they feel like the government is not doing a lot to secure them... No, no. no. What, what Ac happens? According to some research which has already been done, yes. is that they have actually said that as long as the government is not going to give them the security, they will still continue possessing those illicit arms. And during disarmament prog uh, programs, which has actually happened in the past, as far as 1984, uh, I remember at that particular time, General Gaiseri mm -hmm. was a major in the military, mm -hmm. uh, whereby there was actually this uh, disarmament in Pokot. All along, they have actually been this particular problem. So what these people have actually been able to say is that so long as the government will not be able to give them security, they will be able to continue possessing their arms. So what we really need to do is actually public awareness. We need actually to change their mindset. We need to carry out programs related to education so that the young people, as they are growing, should not glorify a gun. They should actually be able to change their culture. Otherwise, these guns, which we only think that is only coming or are spreading in the north part of Kenya, will find its way to the urban center. Well, one of the reasons you say that uh, the, the, the locals, especially like northern part of the country, why they end up uh, looking for those guns, perhaps from our neighboring countries, among other things, is they feel like unless we are guaranteed of security, we're not going to let go of these guns. If that is the problem, if they feel secure, before you think of disarmament, why shouldn't the government think of ensuring that there's adequate security in those regions and then tell these people, give us the guns, because you are asking for security, Absolutely. and then you have given you security? Ma Ma Michael, there's quite, Martin. A lo uh, Martin, sorry. <laughs> there's quite a lot of things which the government has actually been able to do in relation to the issues of small arms in the northern part of Kenya. Uh, they, I remember in, 19, uh, in, in the year 2005, Kenya developed what is called National Action Plan on Small Arms and Light Weapons mm -hmm. on a, a very comprehensive research which was actually carried out by the government and uh, so that they could be able to progress on how the problem can be addressed. The, the implementation plan has actually been done to a certain level. But there have also been some challenges in terms of the implementation of the National Action Plan mm -hmm. on, on small arms. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 it has not actually been so smooth in terms of, because there have actually been terms of challenges the politi politicians, even some of the politicians, have actually been involved uh, on the issues of 
um, uh, encouraging uh, for the issues of even cut wrestling. They have, the issues of cut wrestling has also been connected with the commercialization of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's the, some kind of encouragement. The, some of the law enforcement agencies have also been involved in supplying even um, for the ammunition uh, to, to those who are actually possessing uh, arms because they don't manufacture am ammunition. They, 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 they have the weapons, uh, the guns, but you ask yourself, where do they get the ammunition from? The ammunition. In fact, when you talked about the Central uh, Registration Bureau, mm -hmm. and, and of course you did cite the fact that uh, some of these um, uh, bandits and all those communities are getting some of these firearms from uh, neighboring countries. But then how, which are some of the measures you've put in place to ensure that perhaps some of the officers that work in the Central Registration Bureau do not also um, have some of these guns and perhaps ammunition released to some of these communities. Because you may be thinking this is something that is coming from our neighboring countries and perhaps other countries across the globe when it is something that is internal. Uh, uh, you, you see, uh, for the officers working with the Cent uh, Central Firearm Bureau, they, they are only the licensees. They have no any problem with the issues of control of those arms, the illicit arms. The only problem is um, we are talking about the law enforcement agencies working within uh, those areas where um, the illicit firearms is actually pronounced or cut rustling is rampant. Uh, what I'm talking about is the issue of stockpile uh, management mm -hmm. that if we don't have proper stockpile management the custody that <laughs> the arms in position of the government officers mm -hmm. is not actually being taken care of they will be able to find their way uh, to the illicit market and and this is what we have actually been able to do the issues of record keeping to have them have a proper record keeping so that whoever who is actually given a firearms with the 20 ammunition. You must, this is what we have actually been able to do, the issues of record keeping, to have them have a proper record keeping so that whoever who is actually given a firearms with the 20 ammunition, you must be able, one must be able to account for it, that he used those 20 rounds ammunition during the operation and that he did not sell 10 of them mm -hmm. to, uh, to the cut wrestlers. Is that happening currently? There, there are some cases where even some of the police officers have actually been uh, arrested for actually um, uh, giving out such kind of ammunition. But, but they, they have actually been kind of education because of the stringent measures which has already been put uh, in some of the station. Some of these officers are not, cannot be able to access and even have to give that kind of uh, ammunition because mm -hmm. of the stockpile management. You remember very well, uh, Martin, that uh, uh, the member states, because of the protocol, which in Nairobi protocol on the prevention, control, mm -hmm. and reduction of arms, the, 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 the 12 countries signed a protocol, and they all agreed that they are going to mark their firearms so that if a firearm from Tanzania is found in Kenya you could easily be able to trace and they also agreed on record keeping on how uh, state owned arms can uh, be taken care of uh, so that there is no abuse by the law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. This one has actually been able to work very well and then in the region again uh, the, the, the member states out of that protocol agreed for each and every country to develop a national policy mm -hmm. on small arms mm -hmm. which would be able to be anchored or domesticated into the national legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenya has already developed the national policy on, on small arms but it has not fully been domesticated into the firearms uh, legislation. We still have got chapter 114 of the laws of Kenya, which is still outdated. It really needs to be uh, domiciliated, mm -hmm. incompatible mm -hmm. with the regional agreements. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me refer you back home, and, and let, let, let's look at areas like Capedo, for example. Mm -hmm. 
Um, a few years ago, we had an attack. Of course, that attack left a number of uh, security officers dead. And one of the things was the accusation that uh, illegal firearms, and, and you remember the disarmament, and the, 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 the directive that there's a lot that needs to be done to ensure those, those areas are secure. Uh, fast forward and the other day, we, s we see the same killings in, in those areas when we know uh, for a fact that there was disarmament. Uh, in areas like Tiati, for example, in Baringo, we see those kind of problems. You have a directive that lets carry out disarmament, and then after some time, we see this kind of attacks, guns still back, even amnesty given, but we still have the issue uh, resurfacing. Where is the missing link? You see... Uh the historical perspective of cattle wrestling uh, is long, over 100 years. And if we don't come up with a, a holistic approach uh, in that uh, we only react when a problem has arisen, then we shall be chasing this problem for quite a long time. I'm happy that the government in the recent past has also been able to come up with the, the issue of the KPR. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, which has actually been established and you see that they have, they have actually been, a number of them have been recruited in Baringo, uh, West Pokot, Maraquet, and they have actually been trained. Uh, I, 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 I think what the government is now doing is coming up with a master plan for such regions where there have actually been a problem because uh, if this problem is not addressed, uh, because the problem of those regions is totally unique from problems of other uh, areas, and what the government is now doing is moving towards the right direction. Because, as you rightly said, the 21 police officers who were attacked uh, in, in, in Capedo. The recent uh, attack on 30th of last month, where nine people were also killed, mm -hmm. was as a result of cattle theft, which had been stolen f by the Pokots in Turkana. And when they were actually trying now to uh, discuss about the problem, then some, some of them just walked in the market and started shooting. So, which means that they must the law enforcement agencies on the ground mm -hmm. must be able to assess the problem and then protect the same place. Those are the lesson learned which they must be able to learn from the best practices. Why has it been happening? And then correct the situation. So those are some of the things which needs to be done immediately. Learn from what has it been happening 100 years. Why is it repetition of the same thing? So if we, if we just only wait until when the problem arises, we do the disarmament, we shall continue for quite a long time without succeeding. So from where you sit, as things stand now, there's no... Because you talk about the challenges facing areas like Capedo and Tiati and perhaps Sambur, among other areas, are unique if you compare them to other parts of the country. Absolutely. And, and uh, what we are saying is we, we don't seem to be putting into place unique measures to address unique problems in this particular area? No, 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 not actually. I think what the government has actually been able to do in the recent past <coughs> is actually laudable because this has not been there before. Because you see the issue of recruitment of the KPR. Quite a number of law enforcement agencies have already been sent to that area. This is the master plan I was talking about. The military having been sent more equipment which were not there before, we can now be able to see the government is actually deploying them there. So this is the new measures which I believe that if we continue in this trend, then ultimately the trend of cut wrestling will actually be able to be reduced. And then the other thing is the education, public awareness and education, which we are now doing as the citizen participation in security. I told you that we were in uh, Eldoret yeah. the other week. <laughs> mm -hmm. We brought together 300 chiefs from Turkana, West Pokot, um, Maraquet, and Baringo. And we were actually trying to find out what are the root causes of this particular problem. And there are quite a number of recommendations came in which 
would actually be able to support the initiative which the government is actually undertaking. I like what you say, <coughs> that you are doing, trying to, to, to visit areas like Eldoret and engaging the leaders, the elders, and the locals, so yes. that you get to understand yes. what are the root causes yes. of this particular problem. Yes. But then, you are, the, the, there's already KPR who are deployed to some of these areas. Yes. So the question is, at what point did you think that KPR will be the most viable option to try and uh, improve security because one will have thought that the first thing you do in this case is talk to the leaders, talk to the locals. You know, the management, we talk about bottom-up kind of leadership, not top-bottom. Yes. Uh, and so you consult them first, understand the, the uniqueness of the problem and what they think can be done, and then corroborate with what you have so that you come up with that tangible solution. You, you, you see, Martin, uh, when the, the, this committee was actually appointed, uh, it was first of all a national task force on community policy, mm -hmm. uh, which was appointed by uh, His Excellency the President in 2013. And uh, we, we were given a responsibility to go around the country and find out what is the problem, why is the uh, citizens not participating in the security. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went around all 47 counties and we realized we, get, we got their views, and after getting their views, we made recommendation. When we made the recommendation to the government, they appointed now the citizen participation. Mm -hmm. So out of this, we also talked to the leaders, and the leaders, including the parliamentarians, we, we, we talked to them. The National Police Service, we did talk to them. The, the clergy. The other day we had uh, over 4,000 4, mm -hmm. members of the clergy from, from, from Nairobi uh, to sensitize them on the issues of the security. So calling the chiefs in Eldoret was the other level uh, because we have already been able to sensitize others. We want to bridge the gap between uh, the chiefs as well as the law enforcement agencies so that they can now be able to work together with the, um, the, 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 um, the KPRs. We are taking the KPR, or the government is taking the KPR, because you know the, the, there has actually been a parity between uh, um, uh, the law enforcement agencies on the ground. You can go to a place like Capedo, and you only get about 10 police officers. Mm -hmm. And you know how these cut rustlers normally come. They come in 100 numbers. So we, we need actually to bridge the gap in terms of the law enforcement agencies so that they can now be able to protect the citizens. And when the citizen feels that they are protected, then they can now be able even to surrender the, 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 the firearms. Yeah. Let me ask you this question, that, uh, because we should like, appreciate that some of the things you're dealing with in terms of uh, cattle wrestling, among other challenges, are cultural. Yes or if you may, traditional. Yes. And that those who argue in terms of uh, communication and uh, development and the things that we do, that if you are going to stop a cultural practice, for example, wife inheritance, yeah. among a given uh, community or members of a given community, you ought to ask yourself, if I'm stopping wife inheritance, what is the option? What will fall into place so that you encourage those people that if you abandon this, this is the alternative. Yes. So in this case, you're dealing with cultural wrestling where people feel like it's a culture. It, it's, a, it's a tradition. It's just yes. like eating a, yes. a fish yes. if you go to some area. Yes. So are you also addressing the traditional aspect? Yes. So that you tell these people, if you abandon this, this is the option. You, you, this is, this is the, the core of the problem. Uh, the issue of the uh, uh, culture. culture. And when we talk about even the issues of uh, culture, we also talk about the issue of gun culture. Uh, that uh, some of them glorify the gun. Whoever who does not have a gun would not actually be seen as a man. Yes. Uh, women, for example, encourages even men uh, to go and steal. And they will always be able to tell them that if other men are going to raid, what are you doing? Uh, the issues of dowry, you know, uh, to marry a Turkana or a Pokot woman, you need almost about 100 uh, kettle. So what can we be able to do 
in order that we can be able to change that mindset. Mm -hmm. And the public education is one of the things which is very important, and that is what actually came out mm -hmm. in our blueprint on the National Action Plan mm -hmm. on, on, on the issues of small arms. Building the schools, changing the mindset of the children, those who are actually growing, they should not actually be able to glorify the gun. They should be able to see that one can be able to go through the education process and be able even to go to university, and after that, he or she can be employed, and he can buy as many cattle as possible rather than actually possessing a gun. Mm -hmm. These are some of the programs which we are now emphasizing mm -hmm. in those particular regions mm -hmm. so that we can be able to change their, their mindset. Mm -hmm. Yes. The perception about the, the, the issues of gu guns. But then earlier on you did indicate that uh, this is a problem. Some of the farms we are having yeah. that are being possessed by some of these communities find themselves uh, in the country um, from our neighboring countries. Yes. And if that is the case, what you are simply saying that we have porous borders. Yes, absolutely. And so if we have porous borders, what are we doing to ensure that we try and make them impervious yes. to some of these infiltration? You, you, I didn't mention to you that I was executive uh, secretary of the regional center on small arms. Mm -hmm. Member states, 15 member states, uh, under a protocol which uh, they signed, uh, mandated Kenya government to host the Secretariat on Regional Center on Small Arms. Mm -hmm. And the Secretariat is based here in Nairobi. And then I was appointed now to implement with the, mem with the officers from the other member states to implement that particular protocol. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the protocol is actually the member states to implement the provisions of that particular protocol. And one of them is to uh, apply some mechanism in their own respective countries because one single country wouldn't be able to deal with this particular menace of small arms. And so we, the member states have put in the mechanism. What is applied in Kenya, like in Kenya we have a national focal point, Tans Uganda has one, South Sudan has one, Ethiopia has one. So they are all applying it in their own respective countries. When we talk about disarmament, we agree that disarmament should actually be done simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So that if it's a border operation, you do it simultaneously. Uganda does it on their own side. Kenya does it on their own side. So that disarmament should actually be done simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So that if it's a border operation, you do it simultaneously. Uganda does it on their own side. Kenya does it on their own side so that we can mop out all the illicit arms. And this has actually been able to work in this region. One of the challenges that has uh, first, as we bring this to an end, yeah. that has uh, um, first this country in terms of disarmament, is where you do disarmament in a certain community, and then you exclude the other. And there's that feeling that you seem to be, you know, uh, exposing us. Absolutely. That, that has actually, uh, that is what uh, the master plan now entails that if you are to do a disarmament, because you will disadvantage the other, the other community. community. Mm -hmm. So if it is actually an uh, operation which is actually done in a uh, Pokot, let it be done equally uh, in Marakwit mm -hmm. and also in Baringo. Mm -hmm. Because if you do on one side, then the other group would be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. so, so, and that's the reason why the government has actually uh, deployed the, 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 the KPR in all this region so that they all get uh, an, equal, uh, an equal share mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so that one group is not actually disadvantaged. So those are the lesson learned which uh, Martin was actually telling you that out of the past uh, operation there have been successes and failures mm -hmm. and this is what the government is now learning from it. Mm -hmm. yeah. As we bring this to an end, uh, Dr. Sang, mm -hmm. uh, going forward, what should we expect as a country so that to ensure that this country uh, does not have this, you know, proliferation of those, some of these uh, illegal firearms that appear to be threatening our very own security? No, I, I, th I think our country should be alive that uh, these arms are actually causing a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. they, they kill more than even bombs. Mm -hmm. And you remember very well in 2007, 2008, during the post-election violence, P 
people were going looking for these firearms so that they can be able to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. We really need to sensitize people that these arms are dangerous. And whoever who has actually any information, and if you feel that somebody is a gun runner who is actually running around selling their arms, you should be able to say, if, as, as we always say in our mantra of citizen participation, when you see, you say. say. When you hear, you say. And when you suspect, you say. You say. So because if you don't say, let us take, for example, uh, you see a group of people who are staying in a certain house and you, you, they look suspicious. You don't know whether they are assembling a bomb. And these people, if you don't take care of it, or if you are not um, curious about what they are doing, they might be able to go and use that bomb even in a supermarket. Mm -hmm. And you don't know whether it is you who is going to go to that supermarket mm -hmm. or even one of your kids. Mm -hmm. so, so we would like everybody to be concerned on the security of this uh, great country. Thank you, Dr. San, for getting time to thank be you. with thank, us. Thank I you. appreciate it thank, totally. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, it's a discussion that, uh, of course, uh, we'll be having throughout. That yes. is uh, Dr. Francis Sang, a member of uh, the, citizen, the, the Committee on Citizen Participation and Security, that is uh, CPS, uh, talking about the whole question of uh, small farms. And uh, he says, when you see it, say it. When you hear, say it. And when you suspect, say it. That's the mantra of uh, the CPS, the committee uh, that he worked with. And uh, it's at that point that I went now to pave way for DJ Sanch. That is uh, Samuel Njarog, <laughs> who's coming up next with a lot of entertainment. Uh, and uh, I'm told it is Safina Chen coming up with the first interview. And thereafter, uh, Samuel Njarog will be coming up with uh, the third and the final part of the interview. So stay tuned to the program. Good morning, Kenya. Uh, and uh, a lot is still lined up for you. Thank you for choosing to be with us.